After we announced the discovery of Zool, the public took to it in a really big way. People loved the name Zool and, of course, um, the spectacular preservation of the skull and the tail club just captured people's imaginations. This is my old friend, Zool Curvisator, uh, a dinosaur that I got to help name in 2017, which was very exciting. It's one of the very best ankylosaurs that has ever been found. And I just love the skull because it's so complete, it's so detailed. It just has a lot of charisma and personality, uh, even though it's 76 million years old. I really love the, the big horns at the back of the skull. They have this beautiful furrowed texture right back here behind the eye. It's got these huge triangular horns that come out from under the, the eye, sort of from its cheek. It's got these huge nostrils at the front. It even has bony eyelids, which is very cool to see in a fossil like this. And I just really love the amazing tiled texture on the top of the skull. This is one of the things that helped tell us that it was a new species. It's just a really cool fossil. When Victoria Arbor and I realized that we had something that was very unique, that we couldn't put into any other named species of armored dinosaur, uh, we knew that we had a species that was new to science. And this is an exciting part of being a paleontologist um, when you realize and can make a case that you've got something that differs from all other species and is something brand new, uh, we get to name it. And so at that point, we started to think of what names might be appropriate for our new species. And that's when Victoria Arbor suggested Zool as the genus name and Curvastator as the species name. So the skull of Zool reminded us a lot of a particular movie monster from the 1984 film Ghostbusters. Uh, in the movie, Sigourney Weaver turns into a terror dog named Zool. And uh, we felt like Zool, the movie monster, looked an awful lot like the skull of our new ankylosaur. And the name just kind of stuck. The second part of Zool's name is Curavastator, which is not quite as easy to say as the first part of the name, uh, but in Latin it means destroyer of shins. And so that was really in reference to this amazing tail that was preserved as part of the specimen. Zool's tail has been modified into a weapon called a tail club. It looks a little bit like a battle axe or a sledgehammer. And we think that Zool could have used this particular weapon to defend itself from predators, like the two-legged tyrannosaurs that would have shared its environment. And if it swung its tail, it would have been hitting them in the shin. So it's a little bit silly, but we had a lot of fun coming up with the name all together. Zool was found in the Badlands along the Milk River, just outside of the town of Haver in northern Montana, about 50 kilometers south of the Canadian border in Alberta. Shortly after the Zool skeleton was discovered, it was realized that it was something very special. Uh, the most complete skeleton of one of these tail-clubbed armored dinosaurs that's ever been found. So over the last year and a half, uh, we've been working basically nonstop to bring Zool, our very special new armored dinosaur discovery, to the public here in Toronto. Zool wound up at the Royal Ontario Museum because it kind of fills in a gap that was missing in the collection of dinosaurs from southern Alberta and Montana. So the rocks in southern Alberta, where David Evans does a lot of his field work, are the same rocks that are in Montana, but they don't always have the same dinosaurs in each one. So in order to really get a true snapshot of the full ecosystem, sometimes it makes sense to have dinosaurs from both southern Alberta and Montana. And we didn't have any tail clubbed ankylosaurs yet in the collection, so Zool was an obvious choice for filling out that part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. This particular huge block is so exciting because this is Zool's body. So we're looking at Zool's body from the top down, and what you're seeing is all of the skin and armor preserved in their original positions. It's not just like a rib cage, it's all of the armor that would have been covering Zool's body while it was alive. And most of these little circles that you're seeing are actually the scales, the skin that would have been preserved in place on Zool. So it really gives us an idea of what Zool would have looked like while it was alive. It's a pretty incredible specimen.
Zul would have looked a little bit like a walking prickly coffee table. Um, so it would have been a really wide, fat dinosaur. They have these sort of barrel-shaped bodies covered in spikes. The spikes along the side of the body are these beautiful sort of triangular back-swept spikes that are really sharp. As you go over towards the top of the back, uh, they become a bit more conical with sort of oval bases. And then all around those would have been sort of prickly scales, big oval-shaped scales filling in all of the skin pattern in between between those big spikes. So a very knobbly, prickly ankylosaur overall. So we're looking at Zool's tail. This is the very tip of the tail here. And going all the way back that way, it would attach to the hips down at the other side there. Um, and the really cool thing about ankylosaurs, I think, is their tail club. So instead of having a nice, normal, flexible tail like any other dinosaur, ankylosaurs did this really weird thing where they evolved a stiff tail that's kind of like a sledgehammer or a battle ax. So the back part of this tail all of this part here with all these little little things that look kind of like spaghetti noodles. This part is all stiff and it's tipped by this knob of bone, these giant osteoderms or bony plates that would have been in the skin. And together it makes this like a sledgehammer. I don't know how else to describe it. Being able to work uh, on Zool here at the Royal Ontario Museum has been amazing for my career. Um, I'm pretty sure that this helped launch me into my permanent position at the Royal BC Museum. Um, I've gotten to do some amazing science on it. I've gotten to help curate an exhibit and do lots of public education about Zool, all of which are very important to being a paleontologist at a museum. So I'm really excited to be able to take what I've learned over my career and start up some cool new stuff out in Victoria. The reason I work in the rocks that are exposed in the Milk River area of Alberta is because they are from a particularly exciting time in dinosaur evolution, and they're a great scientific opportunity to sample this poorly known part of Alberta during this time. And given what we know about the Alberta record, we would predict that if we go and we sample in these rocks that are older than Drumheller and Dinosaur Park, that we might find um, new species that might give us an idea of how these sort of famous horned and duckbill dinosaur and tyrannosaur faunas came to be. And sure enough, through our work there, we've discovered over 10 new species of dinosaurs, um, Zool being one of them, uh, even though it's on the Montana side. Uh, and we've really begun to piece together some missing parts of the dinosaur puzzle in the late Cretaceous of North America. So this is what's left after a major excavation of a dinosaur. The duckbill dinosaur that we took out of here was actually found right here, it was sitting on top of this pedestal, weathering out of the cliffside just right here. It was capped by a really hard sandstone, which is why it wasn't collected previously. It took us quite a while with big jackhammers to get through that hard sandstone cap. But once we got actually into this area of the, uh, of the, the rock, where the fossil was preserved, it was actually quite soft. And we can actually basically just excavate the skeleton with knives and paintbrushes. And it turned out really beautiful. It was basically in full articulation right up until the midpoint of the neck. So all the bones were together as they were in life. Once we mapped the skeleton, uh, we decided to collect it as a single block about the size of a car. It weighed 6,000 pounds. Um, and it took up most of the area here in, in, in the quarry. Uh, we spent about five days just plaster jacketing the fossils. Once we got it back to the lab and prepared away the rest of the rock, we realized that on the underside of the skeleton, it was completely covered in skin. So this is a great specimen, even though it didn't have the skull, still really significant fossil for this area. The rocks exposed in the river valleys and badlands all across southern Alberta are about the same age, between 74 and 80 million years ago. And they produce dinosaur fossils, or at least have the potential to. Dinosaurs have even been found within the city limits of Lethbridge. There's been dinosaur found on the golf course. There's even a hadrosaur bone bed, or a duckbill dinosaur bone bed, on the University of Lethbridge campus. So wherever you see rocks of the type that you see around me here in southern Alberta, there's potential to find dinosaurs. Uh, and Lethbridge is a place where some significant fossils have been found in the past. One of the things I do myself is I do prospecting. I go out and I look for dinosaurs for the paleontologists. That's my, my big claim to fame is, is being able to find these things. And I, I'll go out and in an afternoon see what I can find or a day or two or three days. 
And if I find something exciting, I let the paleontologists know, and then they decide if they want to excavate it or not. In southern Alberta, I look wherever my truck takes me. The oddest place to find dinosaur bones was I was out golfing. On the edge of the hole, there was a pocket of badlands, so I got up, put my clubs down and went and looked, and I found dinosaur bone. So you just never know where you're going to find dinosaur bone. It, it, you have to be observant and just look for things that don't belong. Uh, what we're looking for when we look for dinosaurs, uh, specifically, is colors, shapes, textures. For example, like here, here's a, here's a chunk of bone right here. You can see it's a darker color than the rock. Um, it's got a rough texture. It's probably, looks like maybe from a ilium, maybe, or a pelvic bone. It's hard to tell when they're this small, but you can just clean it off in the water. And <laughs> It's not something we would collect, so unless there was more attached to it, and you just continue walking and looking. And the water is great because it erodes the bones away, and it, it helps us find stuff. Alberta is famous for its dinosaurs. In fact, it's one of the very best places to find dinosaurs anywhere in the world. But what people don't know about is the fossil mammals of Alberta, in particular the Ice Age mammals. Ashley Reynolds is a PhD student in my lab at the University of Toronto in the Royal Ontario Museum, and she's a rising star in the field of paleomammalogy here in Canada. She works on extinct Ice Age mammals, notably carnivorans like saber-toothed cats and dire wolves. Their only records in Canada have in fact been found in Medicine Hat. So she's now started her own research project searching for more Ice Age mammals in this region of Southern Alberta. And she's turning up some great new material. So for today's work here at Surprise Bluff, Denny, what I'll get you to do is sort of work up at that spot there where you can see the little hole and maybe you start bringing it over to the west to where we've already taken back the wall a little bit. Talia, I'll get you to work in the same spot as before where there's that exposed bone. We'll start covering it with Vinax, seeing if we can expose a little bit more and maybe uh, hopefully finding some more. And I'll work on taking the spot just to the west of you and bringing it further west. So we'll see how far this bone layer goes and whether or not we can find some more complete and less chunky bone uh, if we dig further into the hill. Surprise Bluff, we are looking at this sort of reddish sediment here that is underlain by a white streak. And all of our bone has been coming right from in here where you see this red color. And we've been finding a lot of really good stuff just along this strip here where you can see the white really prominently. Some of the really interesting things that we've been finding include these bits of spine, which are intact enough that we might actually be able to identify what animal they came from. And that's really important because it'll tell us what was present here at the site. We've also found some really interesting things like a fragment of horse tooth, which is great because horse is very common from this site. And the fact that we found this little shard of horse tooth means that we're in the right area. We're definitely looking at the right sediments. We're not digging way off course or anything like that. And lastly, we've been able to find some really nice small stuff. Like here is a little tiny finger bone from a mammal. What you're seeing over there, the, the sort of darkish gray is the foremost formation, right? And then the gray above it is Olman. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's the contact between those two formations. And the age of that coal seam is somewhere around 80 million years old. But then you sort of go off to the right along that ridge, and there's that sort of yellowy hill. 
And my guess is that's probably Pleistocene. It's probably the stuff that we're standing in now. So that might be an area you'd want to check out in the future. Yeah, so I think our task for sort of the off season is to figure out whose land that is and sort of, you know, follow via satellite how to get into those outcrops and see if we can go and visit them. Yeah. Ice Age mammals lived during the Ice Age about 10,000 to two and a half million years or so ago when glaciers covered large parts of the world. And Ice Age mammals include some of the most famous fossils that we know of, like saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths and woolly rhinos. But these Ice Age megafauna, very charismatic, very famous fossil species, all went extinct about 10,000 years ago. And some argue that the extinction of the Ice Age megafauna was precipitated by humans as much as it was by climate change. And by understanding Ice Age mammals here in Southern Alberta, this will contribute to understanding that mass extinction event, and this might help us understand our role in our biodiversity crisis today.